The media leads us to believe we are living in the most racist times. It's more of an obsession than it is a reality. I think race right now is an obsession in this country, right? We talk whether it's left wing or right wing, we got to come together and, and kind of figure you know this whole thing out. It's so political is Republicans hate Democrats. Democrats hate Republicans. It's just hate and hate won't get you nowhere. It will leave yeah. you stagnant, you know, like people just got to come together. We need to teach our kids, man. It ain't no color barrier and ain't nobody better than you and you ain't better than nobody. Like I always say, you put a jar of 100 red ants and 100 black ants, they're going to get along. It's a true story. As soon as you shake that glass, they're going to start killing each other. Without the Democrats making the Republicans hate and vice versa, there's no politicians. We just got to get better than that, man. We're nearing the point of no return on establishment government politicians, both Republican and Democrats, that are going to screw us for the rest of our lives and our kids are lives are going to be ruined and we got to stop fighting democrat republican black white true and come together and get these assholes out of washington this is Sparta. welcome back to spartan leadership i'm your host josh kosnick hey and today we got leadership in review. We got the greatest man alive, self-proclaimed Emmanuel Whitfield in the studio. Back with another banger. <laughs> <laughs> and we got two other guests, two other friends today that I'll introduce. Uh, Let me got, introduce these guys. Well, you want to introduce? Yeah, I Take it over. Can. We got my man, Peter Guns. <laughs> got my guy, Corey, doing big things. And I'm seriously, we really need to hear Corey out because I've really... I've heard his program, what he got going on. He got something serious that's going on that the nation needs, not just Madison, but the nation needs because I'm coming from experience. I've been there and can't wait for him to tell y'all what he got in store. So let's get it. So let's get it. So Peter Johannes, nicknamed Peter Guns. Peter Guns, yeah. <laughs> and Corey Marion No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nailing that Creole. There you go. <laughs> you got it. You got it. And so for the names and not nicknames, so everyone is clear. Uh, today, we'll go through what we're smoking quick. I gave uh, PJ over there. I gave him the Sober Mesa Brulee Blue. Uh, lighter smoke. To good. How you like it? Real smooth. Real smooth. That's yeah, a smooth one. And well, we got Oliva O for you, right? I got the Oliva. And I always tell you, every time we do an episode, you have to name these cigars. I got that thick Southern accent. I can't pronounce southern it. Accent. And all them baby mamas out there, don't be trying to name your kids after these cigars. I don't want to be at the park hearing no Olivia and Plavalencia and all of that other stuff. So, yeah. I got an uh, Opus X from 2015 that's smoking fantastic right now. And I gave my man Corey a Tabernacle. Uh, that one's the David. Uh, so all these cigars are phenomenal. Any of you guys check it out. Not all of them are easy to find, but are worth it when you can find them. So happy hunting. Mm -hmm. All right. That being said, I want to tee up today's topic. So I invited these two friends of ours because we want to talk about race in America. Uh, I have a firm belief. This is an opinion. This is an opinion, but I don't think it's too far off that coming election in 2024 they will do as much to divide us as possible. And that includes race relations because they've been playing this card forever. Now, I don't know if everyone in the studio agrees with me, but we're going to have a deep dialogue on it about black versus white and how the card is played by these politicians and the media to keep us apart from each other. And I have a feeling in 2024, I'm not saying there's going to be some BLM riots again like there was, but what I am saying is they will play the card to continue to divide us because if black people and white people come together, the politicians are screwed. That's again, true. that's my belief. That's true. And they, they, that's why they play that. So again, we're gonna, we're gonna have a deep dialogue around that. But before we do, we gotta let my man Corey speak on what he's doing. So okay. I'm gonna tee you up here, Corey. Give us, give us the spiel. <clears throat> all right, uh, thanks for having me, first of all. Uh, right now, we're working on a few things. Uh, we have an employment uh, process we do for people who have uh, 
a lot of different hurdles to get where they're trying to go. And uh, during the process of our employment uh, program, we noticed that a lot of people are having trouble with housing. Uh, and these people are making uh, $25 an hour, things of this nature, but they can't get housing due to uh, having evictions, bad credit, not making three times the rent, not having the original deposit, things of this nature. So uh, what we decided is we wanted to create a way so people who don't just need a handout, but people that need a hand up, right? To make sure that they can have the opportunity as most taxpaying Americans should have. And uh, that is creating housing that has a, uh, different components. So first we have shared housing, right? Uh, in our shared housing is a situation where we want people to learn uh, politics of living, right? Without that, uh, it's hard to survive here in America. So you have uh, four people to an apartment, uh, larger than the average apartment. Uh, you have a key fob to your door. Uh, the rent there is 600 a month. This is the beginning process for people who may be sleeping in their car, but been working the past year. Uh, what about your cousin sleeping on your couch in the basement, but getting up every day to do the work? Yeah. Um, what about the young adults that's been in uh, adoption centers, but they're 18 now and they have to be released? Where do they go? What do they do? Uh, we want to make an opportunity for these individuals to be able to win. And uh, from our shared units, you go to a efficiency unit at 750 a month. At the efficiency unit, this is a uh, this is where you start to find yourself truly. Uh, we want to make sure that you have um, your driver's license, a vehicle, uh, get yourself in position to be independent. Uh, from there, you go to a one bedroom. When you get to the one bedroom at nine fifty a month, which is all less than the average rent here in Dane County, this is a place where we help you get your taxes together, get your credit up to par, make sure you have your two year work history. And the uh, ultimate goal is to make sure that they can leave our experience and be a homeowner. Uh, that's from two to three years that you can live at our uh, facility. Uh, or housing. I like to call it uh, support supported employment housing is what it is. So you have to have employment to live here. So we're not just housing people like most low income situations. Uh, low income housing is nothing but a uh, pretty looking Cabrini Greens, if you ask me. Um, they're putting people who's struggling in a position and expect them to be responsible all of a sudden with no resources, no programs, no transportation. So we're doing something totally different than that. We also uh, are going to transport people to employment, medical, or the grocery store. Even if you have a vehicle, we want you to save your money so you can get ahead. You know, that's key. We're also going to have all the programs there. You know, we want to have programs so you don't go backwards. We want to have resources so you can go forward. We want to be able to offer all the things necessary to one-stop shop right here at our housing. And also, I'm an individual that come from a criminal background. You know, um, I was a person who have done eight years in prison, you know, two and a half years in a hole. Like, so you I, know the struggle when you come back home. I know the struggle, too. Yeah. One quick question for you. Would this be available to people? You know, like most places that you apply to rent an apartment out, they have strikes against prior drug convictions and stuff like that. Will that be held against people in your program? Or I think that would be a great gateway to let people like that get a clean slate. So would that be available to people who have prior drug convictions? Yes, uh, we do have our criteria. However, prior drug convictions are allowed. However, people with sexual cases are not allowed. Uh, if you have a murder, you're not allowed. Right. If you had a, <clears throat> yeah. And if you had a battery and you have been free for over two years, it's a, uh, for me, it was a mental mindset that had to change. Mm -hmm. Once that began to change, it takes about a two year process. And once that began to change, we'll allow them as well, but they can't say caught a battery, get two years in prison and, and then they can just come with us. No, you have to be free for two years and then you can be housed with us. Uh, I think this is key for the success of what we're trying to do. But it's not just for people who come from incarceration. It's for everybody. We want we want the people who come from incarceration to be outnumbered by the people that's doing the work and been doing the work so they can see, oh man, he was just in this shared house with me and he just bought a home. Yeah. That's yeah. motivation yeah. to know that, to know upon your release that you could be a homeowner in two to three years. That's very motive. Like 
people need to be able to have their own and people need to be able to have the opportunity to do so and they need to be able to know of the resources to do that and a lot of people are unaware of a lot of those things yeah. what i love about it is you're you're helping those that are trying to contribute to society it's Most, not the freeloaders yeah it's not the ones trying to just live off the government dime all the time they're actually trying to be active in society they're trying to contribute to our communities. Yes, um, you, you, so if uh, society turned their back on these individuals, these individuals are gonna turn their back on society yeah. and commit uh, criminal activity, what they're used to doing. I tell people, you know, in a lot of our low income housing, you have that diamond in the rough, right? Yeah. That gets up, go to work every day, do everything they are supposed to do. However, you have the other individual lurking them out clocking their steps and when they go to work they're breaking in their apartment stealing things you know those are the people we want to help the people that's the diamond in the rough the people that's doing the work the people that um paying taxes are ready and not having this opportunity it's, it's just not fair and um nobody wants it in their backyard however they also don't want a criminal coming through their backyard yeah so well, you want the people to break that cycle. Yeah. And you say they have to keep employment. So this ain't like come stay as a free loan thing. They really have. I think that's real good. I think another thing would be great if they had like in-house medical screenings. I think that's big. I used to go to JP's barbershop and a lot of people don't understand how important like a diabetic screening, uh, colon screenings and stuff like that. When you reach out to people, that's early prevention and that can help. That go a long way, man. You can actually save a life because a lot of people have lingering stuff going on. You know, us as black folks from the hood, we don't like going to the doctor. So when you have an yeah. in-house person like that, that's just something to piggyback off on. But that program, it's just sound, it sounds amazing. And like, I'm, I'm with it. I, I really, I know people right now that's sleeping in cars and stuff like that yeah. will be perfect people for that program. Well, so let me help Corey out here. He could do that. He's just going to need to raise some more money. <laughs> well, let's get that. Uh, yeah, but I'm, that, that's what I'm saying. Money is always needed. Right. Yeah. Let's make that but, clear. But it's not like a handout. This is this is something that will save money in the in the future. You oh, know, for sure. And I'm I think saying, yeah, he can he can add a lot of things. Yeah, but it's a not for profit. So to tell people where they can go if they feel compelled by this story. Tell them where they can go to support the project. Exactly. Uh, well, you can always support what we created at bmcdc.org. That's Black Men Coalition Dane County. Dot. Uh, Org. And um, we're always looking for support. We are going to partner with a lot of other organizations. We're going to help people get their GEDs. We'll partner That's with good. MATC for that. Uh, people want to go on and get a higher education. We're going to partner with the University the Odyssey program. Um, AODA will be uh, something we'll offer. Uh, we'll have a case manager for every individual there. Case managers usually do from five indiv individuals to 30. Mm. Our case managers are just handle 15 individuals. And some of those individuals individuals may not need a case manager. They just needed a hand up so they can continue to do the work and get where they're trying to go, right? Uh, this is key for anybody in those type of situations in our community. The numbers are not lying. The system is totally failing. Yeah. And um, we need to do something about it. And I believe this is a way to really make a difference. I had people say to me, well, why such a big situation? We're gonna be able to house over 140 people. And um, it's a big problem. Right. That's you, why it's a big situation. Do you guys work with uh, probation pro, like extended supervision? Because I know sometimes, you know, probation officers can dictate where a person has to stay or, you know, who they can stay with. Yeah. So, so we're forth. not against working with anybody. However, these are free individuals. Yeah. These are not incarcerated individuals. So they're not on extended supervision. So if, if they are on extended supervision, you know, they have a supervision and officer to work with. And we definitely will be willing to work with the supervision and the probation officers and things like That's that. Huge, huge. Um, but that's up to the individual uh, yeah. because they're not incarcerated yeah. and we're not um, making them do anything, but we do want the people that want to do the work at our housing. Tell me this, do you have anything like that could help them out with like trades? Like what if somebody want to be a truck driver or they wanted to go to like carpentry school or plumbing school and stuff like Welding. that? Welding. Welding. I think that's huge for people trying to make that next jump to society because like you say, man, it's rough out here. I see so many people sleeping in cars and, if they had an open bed, I like how, what's the age, what is, what's the age limit? What is this, what's this age group start from? So you have to be 18 and up. Okay. And um, men and women. Okay. 
at our housing. But it's funny you said something about the uh, trades and the unions. Yeah. Uh, so right now we're partnering with MABA, Madison Area Builders Association, Sierra sure. Concepts, Fendorf. Uh, however, we just had a gala last Friday, our first gala. We had over 300 people there. It was amazing. The union trades, all of the union trades here in Dane County has joined us and supported us wow. and wants to work with us. Mm -hmm. uh, where we're building our housing, there's a sheet metal trade, literally not even um, 50 feet away, 100 feet away, right? Um, and they have uh, made contact with us. I've met with them several times. And this is another way that we're gonna be able to introduce people into the trades, but also, we're looking to partner with the fire department next year. They want to make the fire department a little more diverse. We're going to connect with MATC and make sure that they can do that as well. Actually, uh, Jackson Yard Care, we're going to train people to not just be employees for a landscaping company, but to be uh, a landscaping company owners through our entrepreneurship program that uh, BMO is going to sponsor financially. Um, we are also looking to work with... Um, Oh, there's another one. I'm going to, they're going to be upsetting me. But there's another partnership we're looking to do as well because we've employed over 100 people this year, right? Wow. Um, University of Wisconsin, the uh, hospital. Okay. Are looking to hire 100 people a year from us. You know, we already partnered with Merida Hospital. You yeah. know, uh, they hire 40 people a year from us. Uh, we have a lot of contracts, IPC, Plastic Ingenuity. These, uh, we have a... Uh, an electric engine company wow. that hires people from us. And, and these are just other doors we haven't opened yet because we want to really be mindful of the people that we are putting in a position for employment from our program because we want to have a very respected program yeah. and we want to truly be able to focus on the people we're helping <clears throat> so we don't drop the ball and on Y'all want excellence. Y'all don't want that get in my program and go you know, relapse on some dumb stuff, you know, yeah. you know, actually speak louder than words. I'm about to sign up for that program and get an efficiency first. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> now nah, Corey, Corey on top of his game, man. He over there sounding like a young politician right and, now. And, <laughs> he's on top of his game. And y'all got to see how beautiful this housing is too. Yeah. So if yeah. you guys go to the website, what's the website again? Uh, bmcdc.org. Man. So go check this out. The wet, the, the building that they're building, it's, it's not like, like you mentioned, Cabrini Greens. Like this, this is like a modern looking, beautiful apartment structure. So I want to get us back on track. Uh, I want Corey to tell that story because it truly could be a model for the country. Yeah. yeah. If this takes off yeah. and really help a lot of uh, low income families, people that again are trying to contribute, not trying to go into that cycle. Yeah. All right, PJ. So the, the story that I wanted to create here, not story, the, the, the atmosphere I wanted to create on this podcast was two white men, two black men. So why did I choose Peter? I chose Peter because A, he's a good dude. Appreciate and B, that. he's got more street cred than most of the black people I know. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, 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 been around Peter, for a long time. Peter, 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 you know, my dad was the dean of the business school here for almost 30 years. Um, I chose a different route and it was all choices for me, right? I got into a lot of trouble. Uh, most of my friends growing up were black. So I was able to experience a lot of things that the average white person hasn't, right? I, I, I went to jail with my black friends. I was on probation for almost seven years with my black friends. So I saw a lot of the stuff that, that happened. Um, and I think race right now is an obsession you know, in this country, right? So, um, you know, we talk whether it's left wing or right wing, as you kind of hit on earlier, we gotta, we gotta come together and, and kind of figure, you know, this whole thing out. But, you know, as far as is my background, like I said, I, I think I'm able to speak on certain things that, that the average white person can. Yeah. Um, he got a ghetto pass. We had an after set. Peter in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, what you doing here? <laughs> now, Peter, Peter, Peter got his pass for real. Well, pass, so that's that's the reason and I want to have an honest dialogue about this, because, again, the media leads us to believe we are living in the most racist times possible. And I love the word you used. It's more of an obsession than it is a reality. Yeah. So I wanted to leave it up to E and Corey to start us off. Like, tell us your perspective. And E, you get to tell, talk a lot about this because we have you on regularly. But 
your perspective of growing up when you did mm -hmm. to today and what you've seen with black versus white or the race obsession well, in, in America? What I see is the beauty of growth. The beauty of growth is being in a bubble and staying on a plantation or staying on an island and afraid to explore and get off of that. When I started venturing off instead of going to the ghetto clubs and started going to white clubs, and I still got my ghetto pass, but I got a melting pot. You know, and those who stay on that island and obsess on race, you just gonna miss your blessings. Like I go fishing with 70 year old white guys and I might shoot some dice in the hood. You know, I don't, I, I'm at a point where I don't judge my friends by <clears throat> what color they are or your social status. I'm a man's man. I judge people for their heart. I judge people for what they do. And a lot of people who get caught up in the obsession with race and stuff like that, they only block their blessings. Like I sit up with you, I might meet somebody that's white and they may put me on to something that's huge or my blackness may stop a fight at the cigar bar, you know? I'm just well-rounded and it's beyond race now. It's so political is Republicans hate Democrats. Democrats hate Republicans. It's just hate period right mm -hmm. now. And hate won't get you nowhere. It will leave yeah. you stagnant, you know? like. People just got to come together. Like what Corey got going on right now. Shit, the black neighborhood, ain't, the white community might help him out more than the black community. I bet you there was more white people at that gala than black people would be my Yeah, guess. well, we got to come together. Uh, it was, it was, yeah, you're down. probably right. Probably more balanced. Uh, I would say for me and my thoughts on that, uh, you're definitely correct because I'm learning that. Now. I'm in that phase now, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's a phase, right? Yeah. But let's speak about phase one and two. Yeah. Phase one and two is more of a situation where uh, the government has set the situation for most blacks to fail. That's the ugly uh, side. Yeah, That's because we're side. put into these communities. I had someone tell me, hey, Corey, I'll give you 800,000 as long as you build it in a poor community. And I said, well, why would I want to do that with a liquor store on the corner and somebody selling drugs out the front door? Right. Uh, but but a lot of people in their mind think this is the way to go. They think that's going to help the poor community and the people going through the process. And they that's not true. That person. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and what he, what he tried, what, I think what he's saying is they don't want that cycle to be broken. They want that success to stay in the hood to make people think this is the only place we got. He's mm -hmm. showing them a whole new world. They may want a house out where he's building his facility. Yeah. And that's sometimes a hurdle. They don't they don't want you to jump. And like he said, it does start early. The ugly side of racism is when you grow up and you see a judge now at a cigar bar and they talk to you and they're like, man, I really like you, but you may have been the same judge that didn't even give me an opportunity, just looked at my skin color and was telling me I gotta go do 10 years yeah. over a yeah. petty nonviolent crime. Yeah. Now that's the ugly side of racism. And I mean, it gets deeper than that. You know, Systematic America, failure. America can put borders on our own neighborhoods where I grew up at, you couldn't even walk on a sidewalk or you were trespassing, but they'll open a border up where somebody can come over here, get benefits, get their whole credit erased, child support. They get a clean slate, but we couldn't even walk on the blocks in our own neighborhood, you know? So yeah. racism is still here and it's just so many levels to hatred and racism, but I don't have time to be leaning on crutches. I'm trying to make a brighter future and, and get past that because I got hell of a friends in the hood she, and I got hell of a friends on a, Wall Street. You wanted to bless. Yeah. I wanted to bless yeah. because there's, an, there's so many individuals that have our same capabilities and could do just as good as we're doing, but they don't get to make it through the cracks. Yeah. They, they fail, right? Yeah. Because they don't get to see and experience what we got to experience, mm -hmm. right? That mm -hmm. world roundedness you spoke of. Yeah. That's key to be able to mingle with different people. I know people right now that's super tough in the hood, but don't even feel comfortable talking to a white person. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. I, I can't understand that because to me, you a human too. And yeah. nine times out of 10, you can't whoop me. You yeah. You know, so I'm definitely comfortable. And yeah. uh, there's a lot of people that can do well, but never make it to that phase. They're being in intimidated life. too. A lot of people be intimidated, feel yeah. so uncomfortable in a crowd of out of their uh, natural environment. You yeah. know, I got over that hurdle a long time ago. Let me ask you to this though. Do you think that, so that person that's intimidated to talk to a white person, do you think it's the people like, PJ and I, like the normal community people, or is it more brainwashed in them from the media and politicians telling, telling them 
thing. The white people are bad. That's what it is. It's the media. The media is horrible. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just say that out loud. Uh, Cause I don't, you know, don't nobody control my voice. And I don't, I feel like a lot of people uh, that come from where I come from has been intimidated because of whips that's still on their back. They don't know it. Right. And the media and everything else, uh, all of that together makes one uncomfortable. I mean, even a black man to approach a white female is a discomfort more than so if it was a black woman, it would be a lot easier to approach. And these are things that has been set. The stage has been set and it's just kind of sad. And um, all those things and so many more things has to be uh, is, is hurdles that has to be jumped. So it's just interesting. Go ahead. I mean, what was it for both of you that you were able to get over that hurdle? Because we you know some of the same people and I see, I look at them and say, man, this guy would be great in sales. This guy would be amazing in this. But like you said, opportunity, afraid to get over it. It could be opportunity. I'm a different dude though, man. I, I was born great. I always thought I was the greatest man alive. So <laughs> it started with me young. I had friends from <laughs> everywhere. I'd be in the hood and I'd be over in Shorewood Hills with my friends. So I had an easier route. I'm a people person, but a lot of my people, man, they they haven't even been outside of the hood. I take people to places. They be like, "Dag, it's nice in the cigar bar," yeah. but then it'll backfire. I had a buddy in there this weekend, just dropping n bomb, ready to beat everybody up in the <laughs> damn bar. And I'm looking at my other buddy like, "Why you bring this mother over here?" So everybody don't know how to act somewhere, but it goes. It's a it's a full circle. It goes both ways. I have I take you to the hood, Josh. You you will make it, Peter. You will make it. But I got a lot of white friends and be like, "Get me the hell up out of here!" Immediately, and then you don't yeah. know what you got until you try it. Like when I went salmon fishing, what well, they called me at the uh, cigar bar, King Salmon. I went salmon fishing, they were like, hey man, you wanna go salmon fishing? I told them I'd go, I was trying to skip out on it, right? I was like, man, I don't wanna do this. Went up to Sheboygan, I go every year now. Best time of my life. I got white friends that never been around black people, intimidated, scared as hell. Black people don't be tripping on that, man. They was doing the electric slide a half hour later. <laughs> so Peter will tell you, yeah. man, black people, a lot of white people don't know what it is and won't, don't understand why a lot of black people don't want to leave the hood. It's not about how much money you got. It starts out with wealth. Wealth is health. It starts out with love, unity. You go down to them farms down south, they don't want no big condo in New York. They be living a good life and I tell all my rich friends at the cigar bar I don't care if you're the CEO of Pepsi because when we all have a health scare we realize how yeah. little money counts nope. yeah. I mean, I'll say this I I've been to what I mean after sets and you know crazy places. I've never felt threatened or unwelcome black people don't look at around you like black that. people they've always been accepting hey can I get you know can I get you a play like I, yeah. I've been going it's cool but on the flip side some of our black friends come to the white community they're I, I look at it and the people looking around like who is this? They, they just don't feel welcome. But it's an immediate you, threat. But, yeah. But I'm, go yeah. ahead, Corey. That's when you guys walk in the room, like, Corey, when you walk in the room, Yokes, you come in the room, you guys demand attention. Like, you're yeah, the center. Yeah, because we don't fuck. care. Ain't nobody yeah. going to make us bow our head. Yeah. See, when you well, demand first of all, respect. Corey towers over most of us. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a pride thing, though. Is, when is, you yeah. know who you are, man, yeah. you humble people. Like, the people who probably didn't want to be around me or look down on me, man. I talk to big dogs and I let them know. I don't care if they be having ass kissers, people with money and stuff like that. No, you're a human to me and they respect that. They yeah. respect a straight shooter. They respect somebody who looked them in the eye. And it's not a violent thing. It's just, you my equal. I don't care how much money you got. The confidence yeah. thing. Yeah. I, was, I would say this though, for me, coming from uh, Englewood, 103rd in Chicago, um, that's a different world. I'm gonna be uh, quite clear. A white person, we have these, uh, Mormons and Christians that walk around in our neighborhoods, Jehovah Witnesses. And nine times ten they're white with their white shirt and black slacks. Yeah. No one touches Hi. them. No one bothers them. No one approaches them and say, where you from? Hey, us white and, people don't want to talk to them either. Well, no, they come in, a, they come in there to talk <laughs> to us. Oh, I know. They're now, coming to talk to yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> they be good in the hood, though. But the problem is, if you're a young black person in the wrong neighborhood, walking through you're getting called on who are What's you that you from who what yeah. you rep who you, you know, know you know it's, it becomes an issue and for me i wasn't really around uh, white people when i was in chicago i didn't i didn't really even see them until i went downtown or something like that or you know maybe in traffic but where i was from you didn't you didn't see that it was a total separation and then i started coming to wisconsin when i was like 18 
And I seen white people everywhere. It was like a culture <laughs> shock. I even seen a white person on drugs. And I was like, whoa. What? <laughs> white people do drugs too? At a young age, you know, and I'm like, wow, this is really different, you know. And um, but for me, like, like, like yo said, uh, my mom and my dad had balls, you know. Yeah. So I was born with a nice set. So I'm very comfortable no matter who I'm around, you know. Um, it doesn't matter. When I was incarcerated, I ran a, the prison. State of Wisconsin sent us to Tennessee. I ran a prison for every gang. I don't care what gang you was, even the Aryan Nations. And I ran it by monopolizing the marijuana. So if people didn't move the way I needed them to move, it was an issue, you know, and that was just me being me. It wasn't a plan or any of that. I just was in survival mode and that's the way I went about that's it. That's how you survived in the prison system. Yeah, and I never questioned why God sent me through this, why am I going through this? I just made the best of it, you know? And um, a lot of people don't do that and it's, yeah. it's, it's pretty sad. I got friends right now, I say, hey, the best project managers are drug dealers. I don't care what nobody say. You have to know when the crookedness coming. You got to deal with the snakes. You got to deal with the roaches. You got to deal with everything same under setup. the sun the and be setup. able to be really good at still doing the work. It's just business. It's the wholesale to the retail. And like I always tell people, man, class break glass ceilings, man. When you classy, no matter how much a person want to hurt you, you going to be attracted to something that's a beautiful soul. I got locked up. They pulled me out of Huber up here. They sent me to Lafayette County. I was the only black dude in the whole prison in there with skinheads. I'll never forget the first day this dude jumped up. Nigga rigged the TV. I said, what? But I was so classy. And this is a true story. After the little eight, nine months I did in there, when I was leaving, all them skinheads in Monroe was like, hey, man, let me get your number, man. They clapped for me because I kept it real. I said, man, we ain't going to be dropping N-bombs in here. We're going to get along. We playing Jeopardy. We playing uh, Wheel of Fortune. Half of them couldn't read, so I won all the candy up there. <laughs> like, they respected me after that, man. They respected me, man. Respect go a long way. And like you said, we need to teach our kids, man. It ain't no color bearer and ain't nobody better than you and you ain't better than nobody. And I we're, think the world would be only, better. We're the only country that does it. Yeah. We're the yeah. only country that says black American, white American. You go to Italy, you go to Germany, they just call you American. Hmm. We're the only people that do it to each other. So it's, it's just absolutely, and it's driven again by media and educators and yeah. politicians that say, Black Americans this, white Americans this, white America, black but America. They, they just keep that. drilling it they, into our they, head. But I mean, they need that. Like I always say, you put a jar of 100 red ants and 100 black ants, they're going to get along. And it's a true story. As mm-hmm. soon as you shake that glass, they're going to start killing each other. So it's yeah. no politicians. Without the Democrats making the Republicans hate and vice versa, there's no politicians. And... um we just got to get better than that, man. We, we got to get better than we that. We seem to get a new name every five years now. Yeah. I mean, I can't keep up with it. <laughs> you know, and um, I say it's no different than the iPhone charger port. They change it because it makes them more money, mm-hmm. you know, and they do the same thing. You know, they, they change our names. Now we, I think, BIPOC or something like that or whatever they calling us. And um, I'd be, no, be a Tupac, color, something like that. I don't know. I don't even want to know what it means because somebody called me that we are gonna have a problem. Don't call me nothing but Corey. How about we just call each other Americans? <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. They, yeah, they, they didn't call much. me Tupac. So, <laughs> I, I, I don't think I've ever shared this story publicly, and I think today's the day to do it. I grew up uh, down Peoria, Illinois. Mm, mm-hmm. uh, I think I told you that, Corey. And Peoria got rough. They got a lot of, especially after Cabrini Green got yeah. torn down. Uh, Peoria got a lot of, uh, run, you know, migration. Yeah. And uh, I was 13 years old. It was right the summer before I moved up here to Wisconsin. And I was out with my buddy in a, in a rough part. His mom had a, uh, she worked for a CPA. And we're in a rough part. We were at the playground. And he saw some dude he got in a fight with. Well, that dude went and grabbed two of his friends, both gangbangers, black, black kids. And we had guns held to our head. My friend literally right next to me pissed his pants. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people do that. And I, and I, and I stood there just dumbfounded. Like, because I never, you know, I grew up in white suburbia, right? So I, ne- like, I, I wasn't scared. I was, like, dumbfounded. Yeah. Now, I probably should have been scared. Maybe that was just completely naive on my part. But I was looking at this dude's eyes and just, like, seeing someone that just wasn't there. Yeah, and 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 it was all it was by proxy because my friend beat some other kid up, and he went and got two of his tough friends to come scare the shit out of him. 
Yeah. And so, but I go back to my past. Now, at that point, I could be scared of all black people at 13 years old if that was what I wanted to do because yeah. I was, but that wasn't my only experience. My first friend at growing up was a kid is, who was biracial. His, his mom was white, his dad was black. His name was also Josh. I go back to that. So then I have multiple friends. My first friend that died when I was 16, Nebu, who is a, his family's Nigerian immigrants, died in a car wreck right outside my house. I thought he got mm. shot by police. I'm just bullshit. <laughs> no. I'm just bullshit, no, man. No. And uh, uh, man, I, and it's interesting of all the people I've lost, I can still remember their laughs. Yeah. You know what though, things. Josh? I think we put a lot on people's plate for to think that people can understand the lack of education it's like having a book and you can't read it a lot of people may think a white person may be racist or a black person may be racist because they don't understand they have never like just to make a little a long story short i got a buddy he's a principal right i think like chess i play chess i'm a lawyer within my own mind he was being brought up on charges at the school because he told another black dude you blacker than me man the black dude went and told on him it's a true story I don't want to say his name. He worked at Senate, though. So they want to have a big meeting because he told somebody else, hey, man, you blacker than me. That's like you saying, I'm blacker than you. You know what I'm saying? Now, where I come from, black is beautiful. But see, in the white people's mind, it was a disrespectful thing. Mm. So you know what I told uh, my buddy to do? He was, he, was, he was like ready to get a lawyer. I said, you don't need a lawyer. You flip it and let reality set in. I said, when they bring that to you, this honest to God truth, I said, you tell whoever that was saying you need to be brought up on charges, tell them what's wrong with being black and see how racist they are. Ooh. Black ain't inferior. No. Black is beautiful. And I told my buddy, I said, Jeff, if you would have told him he was good looking, he would look better than you, or if he was smarter than you, they wouldn't have nothing to say. But in their mind, black is inferior. Now they got to show their true prejudice. He came and bought me a cigar. He said, Manuel, Boy, you a bad motherfucker, you know? <laughs> and this is my man, he a principal. But you know, you have to think like that. You had to play chess. I said, flip that on them. Make them tell you what's wrong with being black. And they yeah. didn't have nothing to say. They, they Because they didn't know nobody. Then in reality hit, they was like, wow, that is because me being Because most biased. educators are Democrats and most Democrats don't even see the racism in their own hearts. True, true. Because they see you guys as needing a helping hand from them, the white Democrat. No, we don't need nothing. I don't need no crutches. You know what I'm saying? I'm motivated by Corey's movement. I might steal his idea and go to another state. <laughs> we just have hey, to talk about money. Let's make it everywhere. Let's you make know, it happen. I'll help you franchise and make some money off that. <laughs> now it's the time. Hey, Corey, no, seriously, man, you got, you got something going on with that, man. Like I said, I don't jump on a lot of ships, especially not a slave ship. But what you got going on, man, it's beyond just... It's dope. It's, it's, it's really it's, good for people, man. It's something that's needed, yeah. man. I know how it is coming home out the joint or not knowing where you're going to sleep that next night, man. It's such a boost, man. You know how good it is? See, a lot of people who never had to sleep in the car or had to open the oven up for some heat, they hmm. don't know what a warm bed feel like. Yeah. And then on top of that, you got somebody giving you the right direction instead of saying, come on, man, I'll hook you up with a pack. Somebody teaching you how to weld and you see a welder making $50, $60 an hour. And now yeah. you see, I mean, the game is changing right now. Now yes. the barbers and stuff are the ballers, the dope dealers, they the lanes. Now I see all my barbershop friends, they got houses, BMWs, Benzes. You know, so I look at Spencer and them, I go to their parties. I'm like, man, I was in the wrong profession. And they're not you temporary. Know? Yeah. yeah. Huh? We right. were temporary. I was temporary for a long, long period yeah. of my life. Can't you nobody know? come snatch you up and or can't nobody take yours. You know, who's going to take your black card? Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, I, so. I, yeah. I, I want to speak about a situation I had with uh, my, our employment service, right? Mm -hmm. So we also do transportation for a year. We transport people to and from work if they need it. Uh, so I had an individual. We have these 14 passenger vans. They're wrapped, you know, look really nice. Uh, first vehicles I've ever seen with a uh, black man, anything on it. Right. Uh, we haven't been pulled over yet. I got to I got to throw that out there. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but I had an individual who after work, we would drop everybody off. So he was like one of the second people we would drop off and uh, we were dropping them off at a park, Penn Park, to be exact. Mm hmm. And um, I pulled him to the side. I say, everybody's like, man, he private. He don't want us to know where he live. And I'm like, you know, I pulled him to the side. I said, if you don't want people to know you live, I could drop you off last. Right. He said, no. He said, y'all drop me off right where I'm going. He said, I'm sleeping in a shelter at Penn Park. Oh, wow. I said, outside? He said, yeah. I said, how you getting up every day and, and getting ready for work? And 
He said, man, I do what I got to do. I go to the gas station or, you know, I use my cousin's house every now and then if he ain't, if he being nice to me or I make it happen. And all I could think of my head is this guy's making $25 an hour at sleeping in the park outdoor shelter. They don't even have an indoor outdoor right. shelter, but he's doing the work paying taxes and can't get a roof over his head. Wow. And that's really what, uh, Energized me to focus on this housing situation. Yeah, that might have motivated you to like, I need to step on this and get this done, man. Yeah. But it, look, look at this. Look at this. A former prison inmate that's gotten himself right is solving a solution that our government that we pay taxes couldn't to solve. Can't Ooh, solve. Can't that's strong. For decades. Right? I, 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 you know what I tell people? I don't have an education in anything particular. I don't have a degree in anything at all. What I do have is a purity. I have a, a, a natural drive. You know, I'm up at 4.30 in the morning. I go to sleep at 12 or 1 in the morning. You know, I sleep about four hours a day. Um, but what's needed is um, I feel like I've been sent to prison. All the things I went through, losing my parents at an early age was all God's plan to prepare me for what I'm doing now. And um, I don't, I don't. was your preparation. Yeah, yeah, yeah so it was. life happens for us, not to us. We, you know, one of my mentors says that often. And so I repeat it. Life happened for you, not to you. And now you're best equipped to help the previous version of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you can reach Ooh, people this. that Peter, myself, we can't reach. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's a, it's a good deal um, to be able to do this type of work because it's self fulfilling, right? Oh yeah, it's a reward. Um, it's a reward beyond monetary gain. I think the ugly side of life is though, what's needed is not wanted or needed in America. When I say what's needed is not needed, is they would jump out the gym if Corey was pushing bullshit. The the money would just line up. But what he's doing is. He's, he's, he's weaning people. See, the government need people to need them. All those programs, they, that's big money. They don't want to see nobody buying houses and getting independent. Why do you independent. think Biden pushed the crime bill in 94? Yeah. Why do you think they the pushed it yeah, the back in the government? 70s uh, uh, with a welfare system? I tell everybody like this when I say what's needed is not needed. You think pharmaceutical companies want to come up with a pill that cures somebody? <laughs> Hell no. They yeah. want you on that medicine forever. They need that the job security. Thing. You think these people that he going to clean up and get off the street, that's one last person. That's one less person they can lock up. That's one less person they going to need a welfare uh, uh, society for. And independence. And then when you start leaning into being independent and buying property on your own, that's a no-no. They'll give you everything but some property. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Think about so, this. When I was incarcerated in Black River Falls, it was a minimum. I caught a 360 in the hole from there. Um, Tell them what a 360 in the hole. They have no <laughs> clue what that is. Oh, Corey. okay. Uh, <laughs> you know exactly that's, that is. That's, uh, so they got me for extortion and gambling and uh, running the gang. And what it is is they put you in a cell for uh, about eight months out of that year. Isolated. Isolated. Nobody. You get to use a shower maybe once or twice a week if you're lucky. Uh, the recreation don't happen. They say it do, but it don't happen. And uh, then once the eight months is up, they put you in another unit that they call the, uh, you know, the unit before they put you in population, which is still you lock down most of the yeah. day, right? But just feel uh, way better than the whole. It feel, feel way like better, right? The <laughs> but but the, the part is when I was in Black River Falls, I witnessed legalized slavery. We made a dollar an hour. If you made two dollars, I was the crew leader, whatever I did. So we I learned how to be a lumberjack. When I tell you I was cutting down trees that were so tall, I couldn't even tell you how tall they were. I mean, over 150, like big trees. We cutting them down. We chopping them up. We running a splitter. We chopping with the mule. We stacking wood so high. We climbing up and we got a line. We tossing it. For a dollar an hour. You and we in, watching them right shape. in. You was in I shape. was in good shape. Neither right in our bunions. face. <laughs> they taking the wood. They wrapping about about eight pieces of splitted wood. And they're selling it for $5 right in our face. And we getting paid a dollar. You make $8, $8 a day for an eight, oh, eight and hour And you know the day. crazy part about all that, Josh? 
When you get up to $2, you think you rich in the joint. Man. We started in the bed <laughs> joint at 35 cents. I'm cleaning the whole hospital. But boy, you make $2, them dudes be a commissary. Man. <laughs> you can't wait on that little check, man. You know it'll make you appreciate life, man. No, that's not the crazy part. Yeah. The crazy part is most people don't know that prisons, federal prisons, aren't owned by the federal government. Mm -mm. And therefore, all the taxpayer mm. dollar that's going towards locking people up, especially the nonviolent offenders, like mm -hmm. all those dollars are going to private corporations and making other people rich. Yeah. 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 I was in a, that's the crazy part to me that most people is. don't know that. Yeah. I was in a CCA prison in Mason, Tennessee, uh, a, a federal institution, but I was a state inmate and they had Samoans in there with us, which is out of all the race of people, I've never seen anyone stick together like they do. Mm. No matter what gang you was on the streets, once you're incarcerated, you're under one. And one it's a room. one chief, one assistant chief that plays the politics. And um, when I say they stick together, they move them from federal prison to federal prison because they destroy them. Once they try to uh, put other people with them, they all get life or better. None of them are ever getting out. And this is how I was able to monopolize the prison I was at because the first day there, I told the warden, he said, well, you guys got to go to bed at nine o'clock. I told him you better go get some help and it's not happening, right? Uh, so we had intercons in our room that went to the central booth and uh, a lady came across and I was like, I was like, I could talk to you? She was like, yeah, my head. I'm like, oh, it's on. And she's like, uh, she's like, I think they're coming to take you to the hole. I'm like, I'm already in the hole. She's like, you ain't scared? I'm like, a what? I said, I'll tell you what I am going to do. I'm going to make these soups and they're going to wait because I'm about 300 pounds with a six pack. I'm ready to go to war. So they waited. I made them wait about 40 minutes. You know, they waited. And when they put me in a the hole, they put me in there for like two, three days and they let me out and they put me in a unit with the Samoans. And when I got in there, I seen a brother in there. I said, oh, you from Wisconsin? He said, no, nah, man, I, I caught a case in Hawaii and oh, I, got okay. a, uh, I killed two guys try to come at me and I got a double life sentence. Yo, hold on, do you think they was trying to put you in there with the they was trying to get me whacked. You whacked no, they wanted me dead. See, that but, make you stronger sometimes. Yeah, but what happened was, I'm gonna tell you what happened first. As soon as I got in the unit, they like, you gotta take off your shoes. I'm like, man, I'm not taking nothing off, you know? And I, I'm ready, cause I'm just who I am, right? I'm ready to do it, let's just, come on. And uh, they like, no, that ain't, the, this is a religious Tradition. thing. This is what we, you know, and I said, I realized, and before I took my shoes off, because I started thinking about taking them off, because I'm I'm respectful when it comes to certain things. I studied the Quran, I studied the Eucalypt Forever in Paradise, Jehovah Witness book, the Bible, the Catholic. I just st studied it all because I like to know how people think. So you talk to those white people that came to Cabrini. Yeah, yeah, I, talk, I did. I talked to some Mormons right now. I told them why every picture y'all got, y'all got Jesus white, and y'all said he from the middle. Of the, that needs to be fixed. But anyway, I, um, they put me in that unit, but the chief had already heard about what happened with me. And that's how I got the advantage. The chief told me who was crooked, who would do this, who wouldn't do that, da, 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 da. And once they realized they wasn't going to do nothing to me, the prison let me out of that. Yeah. Right away. You learned too much game. And it didn't mean, too much but respect. it was too late. Yeah. I had the advantage over the Wisconsin inmates because they didn't know nothing. Yeah. So I hurried up and whoop, before you know it, that same uh, individual that talked to me on the intercom transferred over to the central booth in a hole. So I was talking to them every day, all day. Knowledge, right? is, knowledge and, is powerful. Yes. That's why they didn't want slaves to read. That's exactly what you did. Yeah. You didn't know that book of what this dude was going to give you all that game for free. Yeah. And boy, Good you game. become a powerful man when well, you get that game. Well, that's why we're doing what we're doing right now because knowledge is power and they get, we got to let the people know that the media is a game. Yeah. And it's an indoctrination and it's driving us apart. It drove all of the, all of the stuff with George Floyd. I'm gonna oh. wear some clean socks the next time. We taking our shoes off at the next podcast. Next time, that's time. <laughs> <laughs> we will respect each other. For, Put some respect on our name. And for those uh, just listening and not watching, Corey is a big dude. You better come with. You better come with ten dudes. <laughs> Especially back in his younger days, I'm gonna just assume, man, because. That's a big man right there. Man, uh, yeah. But that's what we got to put people up on. That's why I wanted to do this is it's not black versus white. No. It's us versus them. Yeah. It's the American people versus the establishment that are controlling the media, that are controlling the narratives and are trying to drive a wedge in between us Americans. Forget skin color. Anyone that pays attention to skin color 
you get the lowest form of intelligence as it is walking this planet. Yeah. And, and that's what the government creates. Just yeah. know that the government yeah. creates that for some people, but there's other people who's living off the fat of the land and everything been handed down to them. Uh, I'm going through some political stuff right now because they don't want things in their backyard. So Divide to say, and, conquer. and, and they have, it. they have never experienced any of this stuff. They've never experienced struggle. Mm -hmm. Everything yeah. was handed down. Mm -hmm. That nice home, their land. Yeah. Yeah. And, and where do you think it was handed down from? It was taken yeah. and handed down. Some of the most vocal people in the world, they want the, the low income housing. Yeah, we need more of this. We need that. We want it, but we don't want it on anywhere around us. Exactly. Sherwood, for example. I just tapped him because a couple episodes ago, I was, I was joking around. I said, hey, hey, E, we're going to have the old football team over to my house in Bishop's Bay. <laughs> and all these white liberal upper middle class debutantes that live in my neighborhood. Yep. See how uncomfortable yep. they get. And he, just, he leans over, he goes, see how pregnant they get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, you know, they, but them be the same ones with their little Black Lives Matter sign in their window. It's cool to put that up, but just but don't, they don't, want, they don't want it in their neighborhood. They don't want it. And so that's the same thing. And they, they had this Facebook post. Some dude put it up. Well intentioned. He got married down in Chicago and he was talking about, hey, there's a bunch of immigrants uh, coming up there and uh, we want to send them, you know, so old cell phones and this and this and this. And man, I it took everything in my power not to chime in on that post and have everyone in my neighborhood hate me because I was going to be like, have you talked to anyone in Chicago? Hmm. Yeah, it's not the immigrants, the illegal immigrants that need your help. It's the black community where he came from that's getting raped and pillaged for resources yeah. from these immigrants that this uber liberal mayor is fucking with. Yeah. And that's the same in New York City yeah. and same in Chicago. So if you want to do something to help, help the actual American citizens, the black Americans that are getting screwed yeah. right now. Or if you really want to help, have these immigrants come live in your basement. Yeah. Bet you don't. Yeah, they won't. Just like Martha's <laughs> Vineyard when they said, no, we don't want them here. Yeah. We just want to vote liberal and abdicate our responsibility to yeah. be a good, good human being. People yeah. love putting a wedge in between success and knowledge. Basically, like what Corey doing, he teaching me how to read because all I really knew was street stuff. I didn't know you can start your own thing or you can you live live like a boss doing it the right way. Now just imagine if he, what he doing, he trigger like Yogi, go get you one over there. And I tell one of my homeboy, strength come in numbers. And then when you start putting money together and changing the community, it goes beyond getting that big house and that bins. It goes teaching these little kids like what I do, people, it goes unseen, you know? Like when people say, damn, Yogi, you bought everybody on that football team cleats, you know? Because I remember when I played, I was the greatest receiver ever. But my daddy had me out there in Converse. Uh, hey, hold on. <laughs> I could go to my, I can hold on. Hey, I, hey, I can go to my who phone. Who intercepted that ball over your head? And you had to, you had to live with that. Yeah, yeah. That was, like that. was the everybody, only white guy every, in the field. Everybody yeah. get luck. But when I was whooping them down, listen, I had played football for 25 years. I went to the, uh, to the mall. I remember when Creek, you started playing too. I was I talking more than anybody on the yeah. planet. Who are you? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. They didn't call me Jesus and Cleat for nothing. <laughs> but the moral of the story uh, is I was the greatest wide receiver for the South Side Raiders. Got it in my phone if you need proof. The greatest <laughs> receiver to ever play. Um, but I see kids out there in Crocs and baseball cleats. So this is why I tell people it ain't about color because you never know who you're going to need. When you need your brethren, they come through for you. And I went to the cigar bar. I told... Uh, Jason, I said, hey, man, uh, my kids need some uh, football cleats. You know what Jason did? Get the sizes next day. Went to Dick Sports, bought That's everybody on the team cleats. Jason, a yeah. white guy, yeah. also an amazing dude. Unbelievable. We still need some tasting room uh, uh, marketing dollars over here. Yeah, but Jason needs <laughs> to weird, start supplying <laughs> at least the humidor, you know. <laughs> yeah, Let me tell y'all something about sports, right? So I was a kid on 99th and Halsted, on 95th and Western, at 10 years old, 11 years old with what we call the canvas can. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know at the time what I was learning. And we were battling with uh, people selling bean pies and homeless people going from car to oh, car this this to get story. this money. What's like, a canvas can? A canvas can is a little round can with a slit in the top yeah. where you can put coins in or dollars oh, in. Oh, like a UNICEF cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I stole mine every yeah. God, UNICEF. Oh, man, we had an amazing <laughs> coach. Coach said, fill up one for me. 
and fill up one for yourself. No doubt. And I used to come home, my grandma used to be like, where were you getting all this money from? No. I used to be like, my baseball team, right? But I was a kid that was watching for weeks without an opportunity to play because I couldn't afford to. Yeah. So the coach gave him opportunity and he said, hey, this is how you got to pay for your way, your way. And we did that, but I was learning how to approach people, how to read people, yeah. how to get my point across right away. Yeah. And these things were, were, were uh, beautiful things that I use to this day. Uh, I, all the time I used to think, man, my, why we move so much? My mother moved every year, every year. Maybe we stayed somewhere for two years, we was lucky. But I was learning how to adjust to my environment all the time, quickly. But let me talk about a little more about these sports. So we started a youth baseball league. We got over 350 kids on our youth baseball league. It's a free baseball league, the first in the country. All of our kids get uniforms with nice. their names on the back, equipment, uh, hats, two pair of hats actually. Um, and, and, and the Mallards give us uh, free hats for the team. Full and uniform? Full uniform, everything. And blue, blue jeans. You hear me? <laughs> but we can't have them out canvassing. And, no and having that experience we got to have to no learn doubt. how to be aware and all this good stuff you Confidence. get to learn from it. Yeah. Cause people gonna shame you like you got them kids out there. So I created this lead, a BMC and my team created this lead because what we noticed was baseball, America's sport had the lowest numbers in histories in history for black Americans. Mm, yeah. They had black people from other countries but they didn't have many black people from America anymore. The numbers fell so low because there was no opportunity anymore for young black kids. And by the time they get to high school, they're so uncomfortable, they don't even try they out. They play baseball. They try out and play what they're comfortable with playing, which basketball. is the free sport, basketball, it's soccer, football. Fo for yeah. little football. And um, it's amazing that so many kids showed up. He was like, well, you need to charge the parents something. I'm like, I'm like no, that ain't what we want to do. But that comes from selling out, though, Corey, to piggyback on that. That'd be like you starting your thing. And it's, this, is what that, this is what happens when you get successful mm -hmm. and you start to make a change. Big corporations come in. Corey, we'll give you uh, 60 million and buy you out. That's a lot of money. But look mm -hmm. what you lose out on that. When yeah. I say what happened to baseball, let's just go back. The people we celebrate are really the biggest sellouts. And I don't want to get into the all of Martin Luther King, but just think about this. We celebrate Jackie Robinson Day every year. Jackie Robinson sold out black baseball. You had a Negro League with the best baseball players in the world. Sassel Page, Uncle Joe Buck, Jackie Robinson. And then, and then so you couldn't play over in the uh, National Baseball League, MLB. Mm -hmm. But... Who would want to go watch you if you could go watch Florida State in football or go watch Harvard and Yale? You are gonna go watch Florida State and Michigan? You're not gonna. Yeah. That's boring over there. So when you become a sellout like Jackie Robinson, you want to go play in this boring league? I gotta speak up for Jackie, baby. Hold on, just think about. <laughs> I'm listening to I'm, you. I, I like what's great. I like yeah. the Malcolm X's of the world. Yeah. When you got a Jackie Robinson, that'd be like you starting this beautiful company. I'm gonna look at you different if you sold it out for money because what the difference you can make is humongous on the black community. Mm -hmm. So Jackie Robinson want to go play over here with these slow players, this boring baseball league. Now look what happened to the black community. They said you can't play over here, black folk. You can't stay. You can't stay at our hotel. Black people had a hotel. You can't ride in our cabs. You had cabs. You can't eat at our restaurant. We had restaurant. Name a black person that owned a stadium. Do you know how many black stadiums were owned by black people back then? Somebody was making the uniforms. You had the Black Gazette. You had everything black owned. Not only that, you had 20, 30,000 black people getting along, going out every weekend, watching the best baseball black cheerleaders. You had women playing. You had. Oh man, which was, a, which was amazing. You, you had but I, everything, but I gotta get it. But it, it all crumbled. Look what happened when you jumped crumble. Ship. That's why the, the numbers are so low because we don't have a, a process for our black. We had it, kids. but look what right, happened. We had it, it was sold it, out. It, it was now. sold out. It but was this, sold this out. This is what I say in uh, response to that. You got a point. However, I think Jackie Robinson was thinking more of. Our people need to be able to get some of that real money as yeah. well. But you well, look what the money you stopped. No, he's our people ain't getting that money. He got that little money and well, destroyed. You know there's how a lot of more? black Americans in but baseball listen, now, I'm but not about enough. Generation wealth. Look yeah. how much money you destroyed by taking that little check. Look what you would do if you take a little check from somebody. You're gonna destroy motivation because I'm not gonna want to back. Uh, Habish and Habish owning your company the way I'm on to back it with you. That's you true. know, so so you that's how you think the, about Deion Sanders. 
What you mean? Jumping ship? He went from HBU to Colorado. It's kind of the same. It's kind of the same. You know, when you cut the head, the body will fall. I would rather see a black owned company, somebody, a brother owning a stadium and owning a cab company instead of seeing a pro athlete. That's generational wealth. That shows a lot of kids. Hey, I could, man, do you know when you had black people working at the concession stand? And the biggest thing was getting along, the hatred we have for each other. Throw a black concert, throw a black event. If it ain't the elites, now I saw your event went off beautiful and smooth. But man, you know how ratchet our hood get at, at, at a concert, at a high school basketball game now. We destroying our society so it's also the most fun by the way <laughs> but, I, but i was go, saying, to, go to a game in middleton and go to one at, at vincent and tell me which one's, the, which the, one's the, a better time the but there's the also the the, the 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 dividing that the government has created yeah see for us to think that we need to be separated in such a way uh my baseball league a lot of people say black man coalition and they say well why i gotta be black man coalition well black man coalition is about uh changing a stigma that's been put on black men that we just criminals and jail bait right yeah, yeah. Uh, we are a group of black men that's doing the work in a community for everybody to bring everybody together our baseball league has girls boys all races right it's majority black because I'm black and that's who I relate to the most and that's who I know needs the most support yeah. right um, but that's been created by the government for us to feel like we have to stay Separate. In this bubble, yeah, or lesser than yeah. or whatever, and that will hurt yeah. you. That will that, because I would not want to live in a world where I couldn't be cool with Josh and Peter. I would, I would never want to be on an island not to experience. I mean, it's and so, that's why so we need dudes. the Jackie Robinsons. I hear it go both ways. Right? I, I understand. I could see that happening when you kept your establishment, but mm -hmm. when you crumble one other side and you the only you the sole there proprietor, so that's at the that hurt. Point that I think that 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 you both have valid points, and the the problem is is that at that time. The, the money disparity was so great. And I'm not just talking about the paycheck that Jackie got. I'm talking about the ownership of the Brooklyn Dodgers versus some of the Negro League owners. But some things, you, some things are bigger than money. I'm, you, oh, yeah. you talk about the, the money, but I'm talking about the ownership. When you, yeah. when you crush the people who knew, you crushing skill sets, you crushing people who knew how to make uniforms, people who knew how to run businesses, who knew how to run hotels, restaurants, no, got stadiums. Yeah, when that, you, that when, barrier had to be broken. But this is different, let me help you out. No, yo, no, 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 no. You can come to the table when we ask equals, or you may have more money, but at least, okay, I can see if they said, okay, we gonna let Jackie Robinson jump ship and all 40 of these owners get a position in the major league if we merge, yeah. if we merge that. But when you just cut me, off. It's like it's nope. like the dope game. No, that, that, it's yeah. like the dope game. If 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 so and so is selling bricks over here and he's selling bricks, he want to knock you off because he want to control everything. Or he say, "Come work for me." Yeah. So you know, look what company point. you know the company, the corporate world. You be like, "Why did AT and T go buy them out for that much money to eliminate them to monopolize it?" Let me and that's you, what happens. Let me tell you the problem, Yogi. You got a strong point, but this is what I wish would have happened. Just like the Cubans have a Cuban baseball league. Yeah. And they ain't stopping it. Yeah. Right? They come to America, they make that money, they support that Cuban baseball league and make it better. Puerto Ricans do the that's, same thing. that's what I think Jackie should have did or any of those baseball players that went pro. When they start getting that real money, they should have said, okay, we about to make more yeah. uh, uh, Negro League baseball teams and you made them management. You need put more ownership. money in them. They should money comes with ownership. Money comes with it. power. When you when you when you it's when you point. don't own anything, just like the music industry, you could get a million rappers. It's dominated, but it's the dude who owned the masters. It's the dude who yeah. run that industry. Like Malcolm yeah. X said. Now, if you had that Malcolm X mentality, and people people get critical when I say Martin Luther King didn't do a lot for black people, and then he tells you the truth at the end. Look at black politics today they tell you everything that you shouldn't be they want you to be a dependent they want you to vote in certain blocks but when Martin Luther King had an opportunity to possess generation wealth when they see when you hurt a person in their pocket they listen mm -hmm. money talks when Martin Luther King boycotted that bus system what did he do everything wrong he boycotted black Cab companies had the most money they ever had. Carpooling was at an all time rate. The black community had unity. Why do you think they said, okay, it's too much. You can ride on the bus, you can ride anywhere. 
North Carolina had, people don't know, you had Greyhound system, black owned in North Carolina. They had their own city buses. They sat down with Martin Luther King and said, hell with that, let's get our own. He said, no, I want to be able to. Do. So all of that fight just to sit on the front of the bus, which we don't even sit on anymore. And when he went to prison, he said, I feel I've let my people into a burning building. You telling the truth. You sold the people out. You should have been like Malcolm. And I don't want life to be separated, but I would like to grow up to see black ownership. I've never seen nobody try to open something up like you. You know, I see all my other friends do it. I've never seen a brother open. I didn't, you know, as old as I am, you don't even be thinking that's possible. Yeah. And that's what's so beautiful. Now, if somebody come buy you out, it's going to be back to the old status quo. You <laughs> yeah. give a lot of hope, man. And that's yeah. what I'm talking about. You have to set an example for those under you. And sometimes it's not about money. I'm not selling out for nothing. It's principle. You know, yeah, it's, it's principle. principle. All right. So yeah. this is actually a really good segue because the last thing I wanted to cover, we're, you know, we're about that time. Peter, you brought up the, brought up the Mendenhall thing that happened yeah. this week. Can you read that quote? Yeah. Or at see. least the concept of it. Let me see. I got to pull it up here. So for those that don't know, Rashard Mendehall was a former average running back in the NFL. I've he heard of him. NFL. I don't know who he, he played at the University of Illinois. He was a good running back at Illinois. I think I remember. And him. then he played for the Steelers and won a Super Bowl as a kind of a backup. A backup behind Bell. But, uh, no, not behind Bell. Behind Willie Parker. I don't even remember Willie, Willie Parker. Willie Parker fast. He was fast. Man, bro. Willie Parker sounded like yeah. my old neighbor in so. seventh grade. He <laughs> broke in my crib. You tell Willie Parker he stole my Nintendo. <laughs> Goddamn Willie I Parker. Got oh, I got man. So yeah, Richard Mendenhall, uh, he's made some some controversial uh, Yeah, statements. some some statements that have been, you know, a little uh a little out there. But he said uh yesterday he said, I'm sick of the average white guys commenting on football. You're not even good at football. Can we please replace the Pro Bowl with an all black versus all white bowl so these cats can stop trying to teach me who's good at football? I'm better than your goat. So That's you're better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It twisted. Is, what's his last name? Mental Hall of Malik Shabazz Kabuja. Huh? Black power. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's just interesting. Uh, well, what's your take, PJ? My honest assessment is. is I think the comment is 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 ludicrous, and I think it's it's pointless. But also, like, I think the word racism has been cheapened in this in this country significantly. If a white guy had tweeted this, he'd be done, bro. He'd be he'd lose his job, human resources would be he'd be done. But no, just nothing is said on that, right? And so I think there's a huge double standard on that. But I mean, the fact that that he's able to make a comment like that, not banned from Twitter, not do anything like that. I mean. So there is free speech, right? Sure. But there are consequences to saying stupid shit. At right. least there should be. And you're right, there's a double standard. Had you or I said that, although we don't have the platform or status right. that he has, right. but we'd be done. We'd be done permanently. I like, be, I, I, that's true. He's communicated from everything. That's he's, true. He's still got his platform. Now, he is getting lit up by both black and white people because yeah. it is a racist statement. Yep. Yeah. It's a racist statement. Yeah. I believe, You're asking for segregation yeah, again. But free speech trumps all of that. I don't, I don't right. care what he so, said. You, but, people need to grow some thick skin. And, and I mean, all you got to do is say, he talking about white dudes can't play football. Just look at him, Tom Brady rings. I'll just be like scoreboard. Yeah, people need thick skin, man. When, he said, the, thick when skin. he said the goat, I said, what, what goat? Like, you're better than Brady, who has six rings? And played 20 years. And played 20 years? <laughs> yeah. You're better than what goat? Like Christian McCaffrey's a far better running back than you ever were. True. Yeah. So just, I so mean, like people need to stop getting their panties in a bunch when ignorant people say ignorant stuff all the time, you know. But I'm one. I'm a big a proponent of free speech. I, I I don't care what you say. I don't want nobody stepping on free speech. And when you get on that pom pom squad of cancel culture and all of that other stuff, when that come back around and hurts you, I just look at all the people that cheered for uh, people changing laws for Trump. You know, Puff Daddy and all them. Yay! And then that law come back and snatch them. Yep. They changed the statute of limitation just to sue this man and then now Cassie yeah. seen that window it was about to close within two weeks and now Puff Daddy career is over with you know cancel culture is real man and look at the culture, little actor well, cancel culture is perpetrated much like the silent majority was yeah. perpetrated much like political correctness yeah. was perpetrated on all of us to keep us to keep us in line yeah. to shut us up to keep us divided yeah. it's mm -hmm. a it's a weapon 
Yeah, and all well, of the, those in things the, are weapons. The Sound like y'all went to a GD meeting. Oh my god! No, the media I think definitely <laughs> the media picks and, and chooses who they want to who, who they want to call a racist. Like in every in every media thing I see, Trump's the biggest racist in the world, right? Some of the stuff Biden has said and it, done and done, like when he it's, said you can't even go. He said you can't even go to a Seven Eleven these days unless you have a slight Indian accent. But when he said, you I don't want my kids going to school with black goes, kids, it's a racial jungle. If you don't vote for me, you ain't black. Yeah. It's beyond like, that. Know? It's, it's <laughs> be, you know, people get caught up in words. I'm pretty sure Corey will tell you where we come from. Words ain't nothing but words. It's your actions speak louder than words. Mm -hmm. And people can say whatever they want to say about Trump. I got homies that got out of jail and be screaming F Donald Trump. When we know Joe Biden wrote the 94 crime bill, uh, uh, Trump passed the First Step Act. A lot of brothers came home on that. A lot of brothers. And, and, a lot of my friends And then people be blocking their own blessings. But I can't blame them. They don't know any better. But man, when it comes to the media, some people just refuse to love the truth. You know, my sister, I told my sister, Obama, and there's nothing wrong with being gay, but live up to it. Obama writing love letters talking about he fantasized about screwing men every day. That's just what he said. And a lot of people don't know that was suppressed. People don't know about Joe Biden's daughter's diary talking about my daddy takes showers with me and I don't know if he's molesting me. They went and arrested them people at that halfway house and took that. Just how they went, ran and uh, told, um, what's his name, Giuliani, you better give up. You you better not make a copy of that a laptop. You know, you messing with them uh, alphabet boys, man. You getting into a strong world. Like a lot of people, a lot of people don't, did you, did you hear yeah. about Obama writing love letters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but you, it's hard to find that on the, wow. on, on, on. Um, yeah, I didn't even hear about that. It's yeah, it's, it's, it's levels to that, man. Yeah. We, 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 we sit here, we love Obama, man. I look at Donald Trump ain't starting no new wars. And then you got Obama, a black man with daughters. How dare you look and, and people go celebrate this man who brought back slavery in Libya, little black girls getting their shirts ripped off because of Obama, destroying the, the next step for Africa. I go deep and it's real. You can go right in your phone. Hillary Clinton's own emails talking about, we can't let them uh, start their own bank and currency. We got to go take Gaddafi's gold. And they tell you, Gaddafi was a terror. Do you know Gaddafi had the most women in his cabinet? He gave out uh, free health care, free education. He had the most advanced water system in the Middle East. And he was trying to start black currency with African countries and the European countries and Hillary Clinton and Obama destroyed that, you know? So it's just levels to stuff, man. People can make a person a hero or they can make you a zero with words. And like I always say, man, people get in your head. That's why I read and I investigate everything. You know what I'm saying? Somebody can come out of here right now and be like, oh, Corey then was talking about you bad, talking about your podcast was horrible. And you don't know, he might've came out and said, man, this was the greatest thing ever. So you can't move, get moved by emotions and words. You better read that book yeah. or you're going to make a major mistake. And it's and not just like, reading it. It's also thinking. Yeah. yeah. It's being able to have some critical thought because we could read all this stuff and we have no, we, so most of us don't know how, long and how deep the propaganda has gone. Like we were talking before the podcast about the mafia. Most people don't know that prohibition wasn't about banning alcohol for it because it was bad for America. They it's wanted to the get their cut. Because the mafia government. was running it <laughs> yeah. and the government wanted their yeah. cut. Yeah. Just Most like people marijuana. don't know that. A lot of brothers went to jail for marijuana. Now all of a sudden you can buy it over the counter because they're getting their cut. Right. They're coming for cryptocurrency. What? You, you, you can make moves. That's why they hate cash app and stuff like that. They can't control that money with money comes power, power comes control. Just like when control they tried to boycott in Canada with the truck driver, what they do? <clears throat> Electronic banking, cut all of their stuff off. What they got in line. I'll take the jab, I'll do whatever you say. Cut my money off. I might get the dance and the shimmy outside of you telling me <laughs> I can't get into my bank account. And it'll break you down, man. You don't know how bad you need money. Yeah. Man. Well, that's what we don't know that we're at the precipice of. They want total control. And that's why they divide us in black and white and why the full circle on this topic. Told you about them damn big ass words. Precipice sound like a goddamn new shoe that Jordan came out with. What the hell is Precipice? <laughs> Sorry, I'll drop it. I'll drop it to, to fifth grade level. We, fifth grade we, are level. Nearing, <laughs> we are nearing the uh, point of no return. There you go, that damn precipice. We are, we are nearing the point of no return on establishment government politicians, both Republican and Democrats, that are going to screw us for the rest of our lives and our kids' our lives are going to be ruined. And we got to stop fighting Democrat, Republican, black, white, True. and come together and get these assholes out of Washington. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's that's really what it comes down to. They've been screwing us forever, man. And the funny part about it, man, when you start learning the levels to life, man, you be thinking people enemies and they best friends. It's just they're pulling their sheep and wolves and sheep clothing. I learned this a long time ago, man. I will never forget. Had a long battle with the federal government. My boy, Mark Eisenberg, we had a great victory. Gave him a lot of money. Me and my boys went to a Milwaukee Brewer game. This man sitting right next to Chris Van Wagner. I'm dropping names right at a Brewer game. I'm like, I thought they hated each other. They was over there splitting that bread I gave them. You know, that's what Republicans and Democrats do. You know, it's like it's like all-star wrestling. You know, WWF? You were thinking The Rock can't stand Stan Bam Gundy. They count that money up. They're beating each other down fakely, and they count the money up at the end that of the day. Well, whatever. Bam Bam Bigelow. Bam Bam, 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 bam Bigelow. Bam Bam Bigelow. Well, my name would be Provisimus, whatever that damn nerd <laughs> you were. Just drop. I like Superfly Jimmy Schmucker. He, he fly yeah. up that top bunk. Yeah. Yeah. The Ultimate Warrior. The Corey, warrior. Who, was your, who was your wrestler? Uh, the dog. Junk Yard Junk Yard dog. dog, man. You know I'm coming. That was a- <laughs> who was yours? Man, I was, I was a huge Warrior fan. I liked Ric Flair. Rick Flair. Oh, yeah, I love Rick Flair. Rick Flair was gangster. <laughs> oh, but what nobody messing with the claw. That was the bench. What, what was it? The true brothers. Slobbing. What was their name? The Hacksaw Brothers? No, they were. Um the claw. Oh, I can't remember their name. The claw used to be slobbing on yeah, people. They was about four brothers, man. They was they was they was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The they four was really good. No, one of the four horses. So I remember the heart. They brothers. were way before them. Yeah, yeah. All right, man. We gotta wrap this up. That so was good. we could wrap for hours, obviously, on this topic. Bottom line is making sure that, again, we, you know, E and I talk about this all the time, it's unity. Don't let the media, don't let the politicians, don't let Hollywood drive us apart. Yeah. We agree on 95% of things. It's the 5% they focus on, mm-hmm. abortion, immigration, black versus white, these, these things that they want us to focus on that are hot buttons. Yeah, that are hot buttons, and they get us to focus on that versus the ninety-five percent of stuff we agree on. And keeping people victims, they want you to stay a yeah. victim. They want you. To, they want you on the government dole. There you go. I think some of the people that have the most power spend, like when they make decisions on on what's best for like the black community, they spend zero time in the hood. They don't know nothing I don't, about I mean, the I don't, hood. I don't see any of these people like these. Could you imagine Pelosi in the hood? <laughs> I, I would like to see people never step foot. experience. I want to see people with experience. Corey, I'd love to see you, you know, hold some positions and be able to make calls and, and, and do some things because experience is, is the most important thing for me. I think yeah. coming from the black community, the it's like a parent. The worst part about it all, it's your own kindness keeping you on that crutch. You know, it's the black, it's it's the black caucus who want to keep victims you know they want to make little black girls look forward to section eight they want to tell black men they signed up for that 94 crime bill you know they don't stand for nothing it was donald trump who pushed the first step back you know hakeem jeffries and all of these clowns they 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 want us on that plantation they don't want like i say Corey thing man People should be lining up. You he talking about that uh, uh, canvas can? He need a canvas briefcase. That's, that's, what, that's what they need to be donating yeah, to, man. Yeah. I'm really, I mean, think about I'm that. really we, impressed, man. I'm proud of you I, on I that. I will Real say talk. with our baseball, our first supporters was people who were saying stuff like, why only for black kids? And I almost responded in a very ignorant way. And my partner, Ashi, said, no, nah, babe, give them the facts. There you go. And I gave them the facts and they began to be my biggest supporters yeah. every year yeah. to this day. Um, they supported us and, and, and made it happen. The people did. Not these corporations, not these companies. But now, once it's created, we have amazing organizations like Dick Sporting Goods. They say, hey, Corey, every city you want to put this baseball league in, we got 30 grand for you. Yeah. I don't care if it's 10 cities in one year, we're going to support it with 30 grand. Because you know, they, 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 they see success and they jump on that bandwagon. Yeah. Which is, you might as well But, but it's a out. good bandwagon. Yeah. Like, if it's a good bandwagon to jump on, I'm all for it. If yeah. it's something that's needed, that's necessary, that's making a difference, everybody should jump on it. When it's a bad bandwagon, I tell these organizations, I say, hey, you guys want to reach? They said, Corey, how do you reach the people? So I said, I don't even market employment anymore. We yeah. get over 10 people in our office 
every week looking for employment. And they wonder why I said, start hiring some people for your organization that don't get a degree. Now, what that you need come to from do? a lived experience. You know, some people with some purity who actually can relate to the individuals you're yeah. trying to reach. They also need that in the government. The government needs some people that don't get the degrees they feel they should have. You need some people that who can lawyers. understand. Yeah. And that's so crazy. People fall back on that. Well, what's his what's his degree? What kind of degree? No, he, he got a, a life degree. No, but what you need to do of is spread, exactly. spread your exactly. knowledge and start empowering other brothers into places you can't reach. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, I know people up in Green Bay and stuff. Sit down, talk to me. Be like, yo, go get them boys right. Is you be an offshoot of my company and get the name out there in Green Bay? Cause I, I you know, the little CC, you know, yeah. CC coming home, he might need a job. I'm good for CC. You know, CC good, good come brother. home. And when I talk to him, I'm like, man, Corey doing his thing. He real cuz. He go bandwidth. He's got to get this one built first. He's got to get some good leaders exactly. on the team, and then he can go and expand. Oh man, so I'm it's impressed. All, it's all bandwidth, right? Oh, yeah. So I'm touching. I come, I come from building businesses, so I know what Corey's going through. Man, right now. listen, so, listen. You see what? Is you see how it trickles down in that domino effect. I just really heard his story of what he got going on. Now the people I rub shows with, you know, I'm gonna be at that cigar bar. Oh, you, you, okay, you know what? You should invest in this. And I'm gonna break it down. I'm gonna get more knowledge from him yeah. so I can explain to them what he got going on. Yeah. Just how I got them shoes and stuff. It started to take, it's gotta take it to another level now. You know, yeah. open that checkbook up. Half of yeah. that's tax right off to y'all anyway, you know? Yeah. And it make y'all yeah. company look good. We in a we in a we in an era of politically correct. Y'all want to be politically correct, Pepsi? Let's get it. Yeah. You know, do yeah. something for the community. So yeah. this was good though, man. Yeah, this, this might this might be the most important conversation y'all have ever heard. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, make sure you share it far and wide because this is good conversation. Not easy. It's not easy to talk about this stuff. But when you put good people in a room that again aren't going to agree on everything, but agree on the important things. We can actually come to some solution. We can actually have some great dialogue. And you realize, again, world goes to hell in a handbasket. We're not worrying about who's black, who's white, who's no. Christian, who's atheist, who's Republican, who's Democrat. We go help because we're Americans. That's All I Americans see is do. green. And Corey, you going to come back when you break ground on your new facility? You going to come back and join us? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm going to join y'all anytime you call for me. I think I think something like this is... <laughs> <laughs> I'm a busy guy, you know. Hey, uh, what I will say, uh, I'm going to show you guys something after this that I was looking to do. And it's amazing that you did this because uh, we were looking to create a podcast called Black and White. And it's to get the uh, from both sides of the fence to see the ideas and the thought process and uh, what people think about certain things. And this has this is that this is what we this do. is that right here. This so I'm, 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 I'm with this whenever you call yeah, me. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. this is amazing. I think the people need to be able to hear uh, people who actually can speak their mind with no fear. Yes. You know, um, and that's a, you know, so it's so funny you say that. Because I asked a couple other people, and we had another co-host that was scared of speaking his mind. They'd be dropping like you flies. Know? And so it's interesting you say that, is they're worried about what's going to be put into the universe mm. and potentially held against them in the future. So we got to be able to speak our mind and not worry. Because, again, we got while we have free speech... We might as well use it. That's, That's my right. motto. It's not about what you got to lose. It's what you got to gain. Exactly. And they all worried about what they got to lose. I might be seen next to a felon. Oh, man. I, no, you can gain a lot I'm of happy knowledge sitting in from between yeah. two felons. If I catch flack for that, yeah. they're coming from the wrong angle. They're not my people anyhow. No yeah. doubt. Because, right. again, this is about perspective and people doing uh, that have come from all walks of life to get to the point that they're at. And we've all gone through shit. And like PJ said, he grew up with a silver spoon. I did kind of as well. But we, that doesn't mean we haven't been through some shit and don't have some perspective to help bridge this gap. I, we are the best I definitely, I definitely grew up with the silver spoon, but I will say this. It was because of the silver spoon that I'm not a convicted felon sitting here. Right but now. I yes. did see PJ in a lot of ghetto spots <laughs> yes, you did. in my time. Let me make that clear. <laughs> I see him in a lot of uh, situations and places that I didn't expect to see a white person. No doubt. That Peter, Peter right got there. a ghetto pass. But yeah. at the end of the day, man, who's better to tell you the blueprint to success than someone that's 
traveled that road, you know. You don't want to hear about drug rehab from a person that never had a beer or a blunt. You mm-hmm. want to hear from that guy who went through hell and got to the top of the mountain. Those are the best counselors, yeah. you know. Me and Corey, we, we've seen it all. You yeah. know, we've been we've been hooded out and we've seen boardrooms. So that's a long way to go. I never so, thought so I'd be deep salmon time. fishing. And y'all, and, y'all deserve, <laughs> and y'all deserve all the props. No doubt. For being in those rooms as well. And you deserve Thank to be you. in those rooms. Uh, Just so you know. So everybody, Spartans, you know what to do. Share this episode. Remember that good and great are the enemies of possible. Lead like a Spartan today.